everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, I'm Jeannie Rosner. I am the founder behind Soul Food Salon. I know that we have some new people here. Can you raise your hand if this is your first salon? Awesome. Welcome. <laughs> Everyone is welcome. So spread the word to your friends and your family. They're all welcome. We hold them events um, once a month. We've been doing them for about 10 years. And I have a website. It's soulfoodsalon.com. Everything we've done um, in the last 10 years is on that website. Past salons, you can click under events and see past presentations. I have a YouTube channel. Many of the events have been recorded. We are recording today's events. I'm very active, uh, mainly on the social media platform of Instagram. I would love it if you would follow my, my handle. <laughs> um, is Soul Food Salon, all one word, S-O-U-L, Food Salon. Each year we partner with a different nonprofit, and um, my hope would be for you guys to help support me in that endeavor. So this nonprofit that we are partnered with this year is called One Tree Planted, and basically they um, help are helping to reforest California. That's our effort that we are doing with them. One dollar plants one tree. And at the very least, that's yes, you guys can donate one dollar. So you can go on my website, again, soulfoodsalon.com. On the main page, the about page, there's a, a little blurb in the middle all about the partnership that we are having. And very clear, donate here. You click on that, you can make a donation. Many of you in this room have made donations already, and I thank you very much. We've raised about almost $2,000 so far, so that's 2,000 trees. Fabulous. So um, I would love it if you guys would help support me with that. So today I have the pleasure to introduce you all to Karen Gould, and she is a licensed marriage and family therapist as well as an art therapist. She has a practice in Menlo Park, and she um, holds seminars as well, like today. She's going to take us on a journey to have better balance in our life, and she's going to focus on predominantly six facets. I'm going to let Karen take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate it with everything that's going on in everyone's lives. Everything everyone's so busy. So thank you for being here. Thank you to Jeannie for um, inviting me to come here. I had been coming here for about nine months, and I just think this is such a wealth of information. What I love is that these videos are posted, so if I can't come, I can still get the information from previous presenters. So that's wonderful. Um, and I also want to thank my dear friend Carol for introducing me to Soul Food Salon. So I didn't know about it. So yes, I am a marriage family therapist. I'm actually in Palo Alto now. Um, I work with adults of all ages and couples and families. I love what I do. I feel honored to do it. And I feel like my clients are the bravest people I know. Mm -hmm. um, we have such a horrible stigma in this country, in the world really, about mental health. People are weak if they go to therapy, or they are needy if they go to therapy. But when my clients can come to me and trust me with their innermost issues and open up their soul to me, there is nothing more beautiful and more brave. So I am so honored to do what I do. One part of my practice was, uh, in the past, was running divorce support groups. And I had about three going at one time, and I also had a process group. And divorce is traumatic for anyone who's going through it, even if they are the ones who are initiating a divorce, because nobody goes, gets married hoping to get divorced one day. We want to live happily ever after. So it was a trauma. And one of the things I noticed quite quickly was that there were certain people in my groups who were able to move through the trauma more easily, and other people who really had trouble and got stuck. And I started noticing a pattern. And the pattern was the people who were able to move through more easily, a bit quicker, were focusing their energies on six different facets of their lives. So then I started looking at my entire practice, and I started noticing the same pattern. I also was remembering, reflecting on a big transition I had to make, and instinctively I was doing these things also. So I um, decided to create a wellness tool my wellness tool is called the Six Facets of a Balanced Life, and it's a tool for wholeness, not for happiness. Oftentimes, I will teach the tool and people say, what's that happiness tool again? <laughs> it's not that I don't believe in happiness, but I do believe that happiness happens, and wholeness is intentional. So 
happiness is when we get a check from the IRS that we weren't expecting. <laughs> or yes, our child is coming home for Thanksgiving after all. You know, we, we feel really happy about it. But wholeness is something we can work on. And when we are feeling whole, we not only can move through the difficult times easier and with grace and while we're standing on our own two feet, but we also can um, appreciate joy um, more fully. We are more aware. We're more intentional in terms of seeking out things to be grateful for and things that are um, beautiful and joyous in the world. So um, this is a tool for wholeness. I need my glasses. Um, <laughs> it's, my first, uh, it's my first week of wearing glasses. So <laughs> but being old is a real benefit in this profession. What other profession? The older you get, the more clients you get, the more you're expected. So <laughs> So a lot of times what happens is we walk through the world when we're feeling, I call it kind of busy, but when we're feeling kind of agitated or we just don't know why we're in a funky mood and we go into this if only stance. If only my partner would spend more time with me. If only my kids would call more. If only I would get a promotion at work. If only. Instead of looking inwards and saying, what do I need to do first for me? What am I lacking in myself? Where do I need to put my energies? And um, I'll just tell you a funny story. I was in Italy. I came back from Italy where there's a lot of pasta and gelato and I had to try it all so I could tell everybody which ones to go to. Um, and I don't normally eat like that. I came home, a few days later I realized I'm seven pounds over my normal. And I try to keep my inflammation low. So for me, because I have an inflammatory disorder, that was an issue. So I wait three days, five days, nine days, and I keep weighing myself, I'm seven pounds over. So obviously there's something wrong with the scale. <laughs> so I take out the battery and I run to the hardware store. <laughs> and I put the new battery in and there was something wrong with the scale. And I was seven and a half pounds. <laughs> and so here I am. If only the scale would do this and show me this number, then I could have a figure. It couldn't be, Karen, you are eating healthy foods, but you're eating when you're not even hungry. You eat right when you wake up. You're eating way too fast. You're eating way big, too, too big of quantities. I didn't want to look at that. I just wanted the scale to do what it was supposed to do. So also in terms of this, this if only, there's a difference between being needy and needing people. So it is a strength to need people. It's a strength to call a friend and say, I need to cry my eyes out with you. It's a strength to go to therapy. It's a strength to, to be a connected person on this universe. It is a weakness to be needy, and it's a problem to be needy because then we put too much pressure on all our relationships. So I was thinking about this the other day when I was in Oakland with my daughter at the Oakland Museum, which is a phenomenal museum. And there was an exhibit by teenagers. And one of them had this. Plant your own garden, decorate your own soul, instead of waiting for someone to bring you flowers. And I love that. And that's really what this tool is about. Um, there's this great philosopher who you all know of, Martin Buber, who wrote the book I Thou. And his whole point in this book is that when we are whole and we are treating somebody as a thou instead of an it, then we are two whole people connecting on an equal level and respecting each other. I, it, when we have an I, it relationship, it's what can I get from you? What can I get from my kids if I'm feeling lonely? They need to come and visit me. What can I get from this person over here? And what we, what is beneficial is if we are whole, we treat other people as whole people, and we have healthier relationships. So here is a quote. What is the difference between I thou and I it? In an I it relationship, a person views the other as an object to fulfill his or her needs. On the other hand, an I thou relationship involves a person who acknowledges the whole in the other person 
and views his or her partnership as relational rather than discouraged. I highly recommend you read his book, by the way. It's a phenomenal book. So I wanted to talk to you about the difference between intimacy and enmeshment. Intimacy is when you're a whole person, this is a whole person, and you come this close. Enmeshment is when you are half a person, the other person's half a person, and you're this close. And I'm sure you've heard other people talk about, oh, she's my better half, he completes me. And it's all very romantic, but it's not healthy. Um, so intimacy is this. Enmeshment is this. And you, you've heard also parents talk about their kid as being their mini-me or kind of living through their kids. These are enmeshed relationships. If you are in an enmeshed relationship, then you only have one leg and one arm, and the other person has one leg and one arm, and now you pull. So if something happens to that relationship, your mini-me goes off to college, your, your spouse and you or your partner break up or you're just not doing well at the moment, you're standing there with one arm and one leg. And what do we do? When, how do we move through in that situation? We use crutches, right? We need crutches to go on. What are our crutches? Overeating, over drinking, um, overly, de be overly dependent on family members and friends, um, using recreational drugs more than we should. Um, we become dependent on the, on the wrong things. So I came up with the analogy of a diamond. And I like to think of everybody as being a solitaire diamond. And our goal is to make our diamond shine. Um, if we have anything in the middle of the diamond, and that goes dark, it blocks the light, and the diamond can't shine. So I'm going to totally stereotype here and generalize, but men tend to put their career, their work, in the center of their diamond. That tends to be the center of their identity. And women tend to put their love relationship and their children in the center of their diamond. What happens is, if something happens uh, with work or your love relationship, your diamond goes dark. You're not thinking about all the other facets. You're not thinking of, yeah, but I'm healthy and my kids are healthy and I love my, I love whatever else is going. On. I love my creative outlets, and we're not thinking about that. We just get in and bump. So what I'm hoping is that. People have other things in their life besides that main center thing so that they can fall back on and that can keep them strong and structured. So I came up with six facets in which to put our energies. Okay, The six facets that I noticed in my support groups. And the first one is intellectual pursuits. So if you are working at a job, are you satisfied with your job? Are you, if you're not, if not, are you volunteering and are you satisfied with that? Are you engaged intellectually in a book club, in an online class? Do you write? Do you do Sudoku? What kind of things do you do that stimulate yourself intellectually? The other one is friends and community. Do you have at least one friend that when something exciting happens to you, you will call them and say, oh, guess what just happened? Or when you're just feeling like you are feeling like a crazy person at the moment, you're flipping out, do you have that one friend you can call? And are you part of a community? And that could be um, the parents of your, at your kid's school, it could be the neighbors on your street, it could be the people in your yoga class, it could be people in your church or synagogue. Do you feel a part of something bigger than you? Do you have creative pursuits? And I wanna take this time to mention also that um, these facets can interlap. So for example, people could be very creative at work. Um, people can be creative in all, in all different ways. So how many of you feel like you are creative people? OK. How many of you feel that you are not creative? OK. We were built to create. Right? We were built to create humans. We are creative people. We just don't always have access to it. So Jeannie and I were talking about this once at lunch. I love watching kids at preschool run into a preschool room and run up to the easel and run up to the blocks and run up to all the different things there are to do there, and they just engage. They don't stop and say, I'm not really good at this. I don't know how to do this. They just go. 
and it's amazing. Um, so when I was talking to Jeannie about this once, she said, what's your dream? I said, my dream is to have an adult preschool. And I want adults to be able to come in. She said, let's build it. Let's make this space. Because Jeannie's amazing that way. Um, instead, we're doing this creativity class. Uh, I'm doing this creativity class. Um, so there's so many different ways of being creative. Okay? And you can redo how the pillows are on your couch. You can put a plant in a different type of pot. There's all kinds of ways of being creative. Um, but I believe that everybody should sing, even if they feel like they can't carry two, and everyone should dance, even if they feel like they can't keep a beat. And everybody should paint even and draw, even if they're not artists, because creativity is how we put our soul out into the world. And it reduces anxiety. It puts us to a spiritual place when we're really involved in a creative endeavor. I am, I, I paint, I, I draw, I wrote a comedy show, I, I quilt, I play the piano. People say you're so talented. Guess what? I am not talented in any of these things. I'm okay in these things. It doesn't matter. This is not about being talented. It's about having all these avenues in which to explore your soul. And, and we, all enjoy, we all have a right to be in adult preschool. That's our right. That's our God-given right. Um, so, um, this morning, I was dancing in my kitchen. I literally was doing that. Okay, I put on three songs, danced in my kitchen. I was singing in the shower. A lot of you probably cook, you garden. There's all kinds of ways of being creative. This is physical and mental health and exercise. If you have a chronic illness, are you managing it properly? If you use wine or um, marijuana or whatever, are you using it responsibly? Are you getting your colonoscopy when you're supposed to? Are you you're going to the dentist when you're supposed to? Are you hydrating? Are you eating healthy foods? How are you taking care of your health? And are you exercising and doing what you need to do in that way? How many of you feel that you are not a spiritual person? OK, I only had one hand, which is awesome. Um, this is something I'm also very passionate about. We are all spiritual people living inside of a body. When we're born, I talked about the preschool kids, but when we're born, it's like we're the inside of the onion. We're that raw piece in the middle, right? You look at little kids. They give their ugly cry. They don't care what they look like. They run around naked. They don't care. They, they laugh unabashedly. They are just spiritual creatures. And what happens as we move through the world and we, we start feeling shame. We get insulted, we get teased, we get yelled at, what have you, we have other people's expectations, and we start putting these layers of the onion on our inner core. Spirituality for me is how to take out some of those layers of the onion. What can we do to get back to our core? Spirituality to me is getting perspective. It's about looking up. So imagine I was on a stage right now and there was a spotlight on me instead of this light. There's a spotlight and it's a dark stage and all you can see is me. And all I can see is me. I can see my hands and what they're doing, my feet and where they're walking, my laptop and my phone and the stuff that I'm doing. We get stuck in ourselves. We get so wigged out with what we're doing and so focused on what we're doing and then we wonder why we're feeling stressed. Okay, so if you take that um, backwards V, the upside down V, and you put a regular V on top of your head, and you are expansive and you can look up, what do you see? You see the clouds moving across the sky, and that reminds you that this too shall change. You see the birds flying around, and you remember that life goes on. I literally, when I'm not feeling good, I take a blanket on the ground in my backyard and I lay on my back for 15 minutes and I just look up. Because there is a whole world up there that I'm never privy to. I'm so busy with my own little world. My own little world gets stressful. So looking up, is a, I want that on my gravestone. Look up. It's, I just think it, if you remember two words from this, I hope it's to look up. I have a cousin, unfortunately, who's very, very ill with cancer. 
and she interviewed me for my podcast and we were talking for her podcast and we were talking about this and she will say to me I love that and it's helpful I'll also tell you that when I'm at for me being spiritual is when I'm hiking and when I'm at the ocean because it gives me that same feeling of I'm just tiny compared to the rest of the world so when I'm looking out at the vastness of the ocean or I'm looking at the mountains and smelling the earth, I forget myself. And spirituality is also forgetting the self. Being so in the zone of something that you forget who you are and you forget where you are. So when you're in a great conversation with a friend and you're just like, you're talking and talking and all of a sudden you realize, oh, what time is it? And where did all the people in the cafe go? We're the only ones here. You didn't even realize. That's a spiritual moment. When I'm playing, playing tennis and they're just pounding the ball at me and I just get to pound it back and I don't have time to think or feel. Okay. I love it because I get to forget myself. The other day, about a week and a half ago, I was driving downtown Palo Alto. I had no reason to get back for anything, but I'm driving and I'm literally banging on my steering wheel. I'm thinking, oh my God, why don't you guys drive your cars? Why are you going so slow? I was in such a knot. And then I look at the speed limit and I thought, everyone's just going the speed limit and they're just stopping completely at stop signs and I'm out of control. <laughs> and I said to myself, what I tell my clients to say to themselves, be a friend to yourself. Instead of talking down to yourself, say, what do you need? And I said, can I lift the knee? I need to slow down. I need to do some slow deep breathing. Slow, deep breathing is super, super helpful. Taking a deep breath through your nose, holding it to the count of 10, and letting it out through your mouth super slowly. There are days I do this 100 times a day, but it's really, really helpful. And I do recommend everybody does that a couple times a day, maybe three times. Um, the other way that I slow down is when I wake up in the morning, what do we tend to do the minute we wake up? Grab our phones. We grab our phones. I am. I have gotten, admittedly, somewhat addicted to my phone. What I try to do is, I did this morning. I open my window. I open the shades. Open the window. I crawl back into bed, and I just look outside for 15 minutes. I process my dreams, and I just let myself process where I am, who I am, before I grab my phone and play with it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, spirituality is also about being mindful, and I said slowing down, taking space. This is something I have not mastered myself, but when I can do it, it works really well. Three consecutive letters of the alphabet, P, Q, R. P is where presented with a problem or situation. R is we go right to reaction. Typically, we go right to a response or reaction. Q is quiet time to think and feel before we respond, and also to ask a question to the person that's making us, or that we're allowing us to feel out of sorts with. Okay, PQR. So, um, my uh, beautiful brave daughter likes to go backpacking by herself. Um, places. And she called me, this is like three years ago, and she said, Mom, guess what? I'm going to Guatemala by myself, and I'm going to go backpacking. I didn't, there was no two. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? What do you mean you go backpacking here? It's bad enough that you go backpacking, you were in by yourself, so you can't go to a third world country. What are you thinking? She hung up on me. And rightly so. Because I took my, what I was feeling, which was total anxiety and fear, and I vomited on. I didn't take care of myself. I didn't take some quiet time to take a breath and to maybe say, tell me more. It's another thing that I hope you take away. Tell me more. It's totally counterintuitive when your partner says, you know, I think I want to sell the house and let, let's move to Timbuktu. <sighs> tell me more. <laughs> I would tell you to do that. But it is super important because we need to gather information. We need to understand what people are telling us. So now when my daughter tells me these things, I say, wow, tell me more. She tells me, I calm myself 
And then I say, that sounds great. I totally understand why you want to do that. Of course, as a mom, I'm a little concerned. Can I ask you a couple of questions? And our conversation continues. Spirituality is also about doing less. I want you to imagine. I love to read. Imagine the words on a page in a book. You can read a book. You're all absorbed. Imagine that we are a page in the book. And everything we do and everything we hear and everything we see and every conversation we have, everything we do that day are more and more words on the page. To the point where there is no there are no spaces between the words. We're so jammed up. The space the page gets so jammed up there's no white space. We could still read it, but even with these fancy new glasses, it's gonna be very, very frustrating. We're gonna get really irritated. And that's what happens when we have too many things going on without time to process. We have to process what's going on with us. So again, the 15 minutes before bed, taking 10 minutes twice a day and just going outside. Go outside and look up at a tree, do some slow deep breathing. Do one little yoga pose while you're doing that for a few moments. Look at a candle and watch it burn. Anything you can do to just Take a break from your day. At work, go outside, take a walk, come back. Go up and down the stairs, and come back. But give yourself a break so that you, your mind can process what's happening. The other thing I'd like to talk about in terms of mindfulness is gratitude. Um, one of my dear friends, um, Susie, she said to me God, eight or nine years ago, I am keeping a gratitude journal, and every day I'm going to write down three things that I'm grateful for. And I said, oh, that's nice. But inside I'm thinking, that's so stupid. There's all these other feelings. Why just write about gratitude? There's all kinds of other things that happen in life. I don't do anything, even something a doctor tells me to do without understanding it. I have to understand things intellectually. So I researched this, and I learned about the neuroscience of gratitude. And I learned that we mark our past. If someone were to say, give me a time outline of your life, more negative things would be there than positive things because the negative things land with us deeper. They cause deeper scars. The positive things, unfortunately, tend to roll off our back quicker. So we, we look back and we're like, that's when my cousin got sick. That's when we had the car accident. That's when blah, 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 the negatives, right? If you are filled with memories about negative things, how do you move forward with any hope and optimism? It's really hard. So I started keeping a gratitude journal. And I've been doing it now for about eight or nine years. I don't have any kind of expectations for myself. It's not fancy prose. It's literally, I feel grateful for my text, that text I got from my son saying, I love you out of nowhere. I feel grateful that I got to see my best friend today. I, whatever. And sometimes it's two pages and sometimes it's two sentences. There was one time when I sprained my ankle and I was, my whole body was just in so much pain. I was miserable. And I thought, there's nothing I have to be grateful for. <laughs> and then I wrote down, I'm grateful that my left toe doesn't hurt. <laughs> we can always find something to feel grateful for. Then, fast forward, um, from the time I started keeping my gratitude journal until about five years ago, I came down with a really horrific, debilitating skin disorder. I had big, red, hard patches on every part of my body. I blew up 15 pounds of water weight. My palms of my hands and the bottoms of my feet were thick and cracked and bleeding. It affected my nose, my ears, my vision. I lost a third of my hair. And my friend would come over to bring me food and they'd say, you don't seem depressed. Like, you're miserable, but you're not depressed. And I said, well, I'm not in the hospital. I get to be home and I get to look out of my backyard. <laughs> I'm not going to die from this. I can't work, but I can do some phone sessions in a couple weeks. This is not typically who I am. Okay, This was because of the gratitude journal. This literally, I incorporated gratitude, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I needed to stay with gratitude because if I lived in my misery, I would have drowned in it. I feel that the goal in walking through the world is to hold grief in one hand and gratitude in the other. I forgot the grief. I, didn't, I couldn't deal with grief at that time. 
So what happened was once my body got better because of medicine, I fell into a pretty, not severe, but I felt I got depressed. I got pretty depressed. And all these coincidences have been happening to me lately, and I'm literally thinking about this, and then I was reading a book by Anne Patchett called Tom Lake. By the way, it's narrated by Meryl Streep. It's an amazing narration. Um, and she wrote this more beautifully than I could. It's not that I'm unaware of suffering and the soon to be more suffering in the world. It's that I know suffering exists beside wet grass and a bright blue sky recently scrubbed by rain. The beauty and the suffering are equally true. I love that. And right now with the craziness that's going on in the world, it's really, it's that much more important to remember that the sun is still, still shining and there are good people in the world, that there are people who love us. Gratitude and grief. That's the, that's the goal, <coughs> to try to balance those two things. Life force and sexuality. First I wanted to show you my dish towel. <laughs> I want to explain that that's not what this is really about, life force and sexuality. It's not about having sex two and a half times a week. Life force and sexuality is about, it's always hard for me to explain it. It's about feeling comfortable in your skin. It's about walking into a room and looking people in the eye and saying, Hi, I'm Karen. Okay. I used to be painfully, painfully shy growing up. There was no life force. I'd walk into a room and go like this. Okay. Life force is feeling comfortable with yourself. It's saying hello to people when you're online at Starbucks instead of sitting there scrolling through your phone. Um, and life force and sexuality is also being aware of the sensations that are going on in your body. Are you feeling like you want sex? Are you feeling like you're tired? Are you feeling like your back aches? Are you feeling like you're hungry? What do you need? What is your body feeling? We forget our bodies. That's why so many people have back aches, right? We just walk through, like, I can do this, I can do this. We're not aware of our bodies and our sensations. So I ask people, are you aware of your sexuality? Do you ever think about your body in a sexual way? We are in a total crisis here of people not having sex. And I say crisis because that is all involved in intimacy and young people, my clients, my, my colleagues attest to this. We are seeing so many young people marry with no children who are not sexually active. They're so busy living that life that they lived in high school. Let's get that AP class. Let's get into the best college, blah, blah, blah. And if they learn that, it doesn't really stop. And they're not taking time to connect, to feel their bodies, and to be intimate. If you don't have a partner, are you having sex by yourself? Are you just... Thinking about it, are you wearing a sexy bra even if no one's going to see it? Are you sometimes just like getting a new hairdo or putting on some lipstick or you know putting on a new jacket? What are you doing to make yourself feel good in the world as you walk around the world? So the way I use this tool is to have a bar graph. And um, if you could pass out those uh, bar graphs. What I tell people is, at this moment in time, how satisfied am I in terms of health and exercise? How satisfied am I in terms of engaging in intellectual pursuits? How satisfied am I in terms of the time I spend being creative? And the purpose is to make a bar graph. So I'm going to have you do that right now. If you're about 50% satisfied, it would be over here. If you're about 10% satisfied, it might be over there. And just quickly do an inventory. Um, you don't have to color it in, but just make a, a horizontal line with each of these right now and see, see where you're at. Um, does anyone want to share what their highest was and what their lowest was? Yeah, go ahead. And from friends and community. Friends and community was your highest? Yes. Okay, and what was your lowest? Intellectual opportunity and uh, life works. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to share theirs? Phyllis. Friends and community was the highest, and spirituality was the lowest. Okay. Wendy, were you raising your hand? No, but I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw a hand over there. Yeah, I have spirituality and friends and community were both my highest. They're tied and created pursuits of the lowest. Okay. Anyone else want to share? 
Yes, Jeannie. Um, health and exercise, friends and community were the high. Spirituality was my love. Okay. Yes, my spirituality and friends were my high and intellectual pursuits were my love. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to say, this is a pretty spiritual and creative group in general because typically cre creativity and spirituality for most people tends to be toward the bottom. Um, so it's nice to hear um, people say otherwise. Anyone else want to share? Yes, Bill. Highest health and exercise, lowest spirituality. Okay. Thank you. So now what I'm going to ask you to do um, is in these white spaces, um, and if there's no white space up there, add one to two little things that you can do in the next two weeks that might increase your life. Now, I really believe in little shifts and not big changes. I tell people, don't say you're gonna go lose those seven pounds in the next two days. Just increase the amount of water you're drinking and maybe eat some more broccoli this week. Spirituality might be just spent 10 minutes in the next week just looking up at the sky. So little tiny things so that at the end of the week or whatever, you're not feeling bad about yourself that you didn't do them, but these are really doable little tiny things. Intellectual pursuits might be just going online and looking at a class that you might want to take and not even signing up, but just looking and seeing what's there. For friends and community, I tell people, just text a friend you haven't talked to in a long time. You don't have to get together if you're not doing it. Send a text to someone saying, thinking of you. Yeah. For creative pursuits, I can't even think of a creative pursuit. <laughs> Do you have any ideas? I'm going to give you one. Thank you for reminding me. Make a scribble. Make a loopy scribble. And then take some crayons and color in the spaces. Adult preschool. <laughs> <laughs> but there is some magic in terms of this. It's very simple. You don't have to worry about, oh my god, am I drawing a tree, right? You're doing a scribble, right? So there's no expectation in terms of the product, but it does end up looking pretty. Also, again, in terms of the neuroscience, scribbling, as well as knitting, um, as well as playing the piano, because you're doing two hands and you're connecting left, well, this is your one hand, but you're connecting left brain, right brain, which reduces anxiety. This is a tool that I um, used to give my son who had ADD-ish type of behaviors before he, when he was in elementary school, before he did his homework. Hogged him down, made him centered. I have CEOs of major companies. Really a scribble girl. <laughs> If you know anyone that is feeling anxious or you just want to use this as your mindfulness activity, once a day, do a scribble job. It's not going to change your life, but it's going to reduce your anxiety and give you a moment. Some, I did talk about this with one of my co colleagues who has little kids, and every day, she and the little kids do a scribble job. So, Wendy, thank you, because I spent the time scribbling to show you, and I would have forgotten. <laughs> Does anyone want to share a couple of the things that they put down for health and exercise? And you can just call them out. Eat more protein. Eat more protein. Anyone else on health and exercise? Use more weights in my workout. Use more weights. Sign up for Pilates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. Do more yoga. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. I think just being more present in my exercise rather than just like going through the motion mm -hmm. and checking it off. Yeah. Great. Okay. Anyone want to share what they put down for intellectual pursuits? Reading more. But read more. Okay. Reading more. Okay. We're in masters in computer science. I already have a master's in computer science, but for so long, one on one. Wow. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> That's not a little thing to say. Thanks, <laughs> 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 Okay. Good for you. Yes. I didn't do two story core write ups a week. Story core write ups? Uh, story work. My oh. daughter gave me story work for, for the whole year, writing a memoir. Oh, beautiful. And I, I could keep putting it off, but I've been in uh, trying to do two a week. Good. Or okay. she would actually, she would next week. Okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> 
Spirituality? Anyone put anything for spirituality? Can we share? Yes. Um, meditate 10 minutes a day. Okay, great. Yes. Um, start the day with a prayer. Okay, beautiful. Yes. Uh, outdoor walks. Nice. Some people do mindfulness walks mm -hmm. where they don't listen to anything, they don't talk to anybody, and they just try to notice mm -hmm. what's around them. Um, my friend Carol and I did a mindfulness walk uh, about a week and a half ago. We just did a silent walk. Um, ran into Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was lovely. Just And it's amazing what you notice when you're really quiet. A lot of my ideas overlap. Do you encourage that? So like oftentimes I like to walk and read at the same time and I feel like that fits in multiple buckets. Mm -hmm. Or I, you know, I'd like... Do you encourage that they overlap, or do you encourage that it only focuses? I totally encourage it. I mean, that's obviously not going to be your mindfulness walk you're reading, but you're right. doing your intellectual and you're doing your physical. Right. Right. I I often walk with a friend, and that's how I get my social. Right. I don't want to sit and have lunch. I don't like to do that mostly. I like to go walking. So that's what I do with my friends. So a lot of these overlap. Sex can be a spiritual experience, right? Um, a runner's high. People talk about the runner's high. So they're exercising, they're getting their physical health and exercise, and they're also having a spiritual, mindful experience. So a lot of these overlap. Um, people can be extremely creative at work. So um, did we talk about life force sexuality? Anyone want to share what they have? I'll share. Yes. Um, I want to do less body scanning on myself and picking myself apart. That's important to build confidence. Sometimes with my female clients, when they're having body image issues, I have them look in the mirror naked and find one to three things. Then they don't. One person said, can I just do one? <laughs> Start with one, sure. But we are so trained to not like our bodies. But they're supposed to be so perfect, like, you know, like in the Marvin movie. But our bodies are beautiful and they're healthy and they do what we need them to do. So. Anyone else on life force sexuality? They combine most of them more. Oh, tell people you love them more. Yeah, nice. That yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, Carol. I remember um, Jean had Shauna here. Shauna Shapiro. Shauna Shapiro. Oh. And um, she said, wake up every morning and look at yourself in the mirror or not and just say, I love you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, I love Good you. Good morning, I love you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was at that talk. Yes, that's great. It's what, really hard. It is really hard. So one of the things I'm trying to do is talk to myself in a nicer way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always, always, I get in the car to go somewhere. I'm like, oh, I my glasses. And then I get in the car, oh my god, I forgot my appointment book. And it's always like, damn it, damn it. You know, and I, that's how I talk to myself. That's how I was talking to myself. And in the last year, I've made a real effort to say, it's okay, Karen. You're getting all done. This is going to happen every day. So enjoy the walk back to the front door. <laughs> it's, it's fine. You know, and it's, it's hard for me to be nice to myself, but we need to treat ourselves like we would treat our friends. Before I stop, this is about the creativity class I'm going to give. My email is here. Um, because I am so passionate about being creative, um, I was at one point slotted to give a 10-week creativity class at Stanford Continuing Education. And unfortunately, they had some scheduling issues, and I, I couldn't do it. But it's really important to me. So I will be doing, I'll do this for the general public. And if you ever just want to have a bunch of people over and have me guide you in this way, in a safe, supportive way to engage in creative pursuits, I will help you. Um, I also just want to take a moment to just show you some of my favorite books that I can't live without. So this book by Esther Perel, Love Esther Perel. Um, she wrote this book, Mating in Captivity. It's all about how to keep connection alive with your partner if you're living together. Because the best way to destroy a romance is to share a bathroom and live together and raise kids and pay bills. <laughs> um, this is an amazing book. This book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. This helped me personally more than any other book. I had spent most of my life being an introvert, and I had so many sensory issues. Lights are too bright, sounds are too loud, 
crowds are too much for me. I, I was always down on myself. What's wrong with me? Why do I want to just like go to a party and just talk to one person instead of like be the center of the room? And this helped me feel like not only was I okay, but there's there's benefits. Who's the author? I don't know. The author is Susan Cain, C A I N. The body keeps the score. This is a really amazing book by Bessel van der Kolk, K O L K, and it's about really how our body holds on to trauma and holds on to negative things that have happened to us. Um, these are books that, by the way, I feel everybody should have. That's why. That's why I'm <laughs> I'm showing them to you. Um, so love this book as well. When things fall apart. Again, a, a amazing book. Right? Oh, she's, she's fabulous. I'm sorry. Is that? I was just downloading for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a great book to offer hope. The Seven Principles of Making Marriage Work by John Gottman. Every couple I see, I tell them to read this book. There are so many little things that we do to erode a relationship. There are so many little things that we can do to make a relationship better. And it's in this book. This is, all his books are great. This is, this is phenomenal. Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankl. I can't even describe. I can't even describe. He was a Holocaust survivor. Um, this book gives self so much hope and courage. And the book that I sleep with every night, <laughs> so romantic, is <laughs> The Wisdom of Not Knowing. You can see that I'm very into this book right now. In fact, I've been spending time with the author Estelle Frankel. She's um, a spiritual leader, and she's also a psychologist. Uh, she is phenomenal. All of our anxiety is based on not knowing the future. That's what anxiety is about. It's worrying about the future. Depression is about feeling bad about the past. How do we move forward in the world when we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow? That's what this is about. Who's the author? Estelle Frankel, F-R-A-N-K-E-L. The Wisdom of Not Knowing, Discovering a Life of Wonder by Embracing Uncertainty. So, anyway, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.